So we're ready for the second part. Christos will uh, set the stage and give us the, the conceptual message, and then at some point I'll I'll, I'll take over. Very good. So um, uh, going ahead. Uh, uh, all right. So the whole point is that um, this is what I mean by the by the overarching problem. Uh, there is uh, we understand more and more about uh, about uh, animal and human cognition. That's the left part. We are understanding more and more about molecules and neurons and synapses. And there is a gap in between. Okay, so despite accelerating progress in neuroscience uh, and increasing progress in cognitive science, uh, there is no overarching theory that tells us how does the brain beget the mind. Okay, and in fact, uh, very recently, so you know, when we read, you know, uh, that's the next slide. Uh, uh, the uh, Richard Axel, the Nobel laureate who, who discovered olfaction, and sort of you know, he's uh, he's uh, our hero in this. Uh, he uh, said so in uh, very publicly in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in the journal Neuron, the main journal, the, the main journal of the field. Uh, he admitted we do not have a logic, a logic for the transformation of neural activity into thought, I view discerning this logic as the most important future direction of neuroscience. So we had been working on this problem. And when we read this, so, you know, Santos and I felt that we have been blessed by the Pope. Okay, so, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, uh, sort of this exactly what we know. And, and the question is going next, uh, one slide. Uh, this is obviously a call to action for theoretical computer scientists. I mean, they're asking us to articulate a formal theory which will translate neural activity into thought and action. Okay, so that, that's, that's sort of amazing. And of course, uh, we should at this point remember uh, uh, an amazing work done a quarter of a century ago by a giant in our field, Les Valiant. Who was going after precisely this question, sort of you know, in many ways ahead of its time? Okay, right? sort of you know that 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 uh, how how can we bridge the gap between what we know about neurons, which back then we didn't know that much, and what uh, we believe that that uh, human cognition, for example, is about? Okay, so let me let me go ahead and tell you uh, our story, Santos and I, of mine. Okay, so you know that. Uh, as I told you, six years ago, six and a half years ago, we decided to study the brain. Okay, so you know, it has been uh, the most fascinating thing that uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, I have ever done, uh, and also by far the hardest. Okay, so you know, it is the steepest rock I ever climbed. Okay, you know, it's uh, 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 the most disorienting, the most uh, confusing, the most uh, disappointing uh, most of the time. Okay, you know, so. Uh, in, uh, uh, soon after that, we start writing theory papers about it. And then uh, around 2016, we got feedback, feedback from, uh, you know, you can advance the slide now, uh, Santos. We got feedback about this, uh, this, uh, this uh, our work and uh, it didn't feel, feel good. Okay, so, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, you can go back, uh, sorry. Uh, I, want, I want to see the, the black eye, okay. You know, the, um, and uh, and uh, so we got feedback from people who knew some neuroscience, and uh, it was devastating. Okay, so you know that that we don't know what, what, what we are talking about. Okay, and uh, uh, we ended up uh, apprenticing by these people, and uh, soon after that, we we sort of you know we assimilated enough and we understood the, the field enough that we started working on the logic problem, okay, which back then we didn't know that uh, that Axel would call it the logic problem. Uh, how to bridge the gap between between cognition and, and neurons. And uh, so what are we looking for? We're looking for a computational system, which is consistent with current understanding of the brain, and which explains high level cognitive phenomena. It uh, ex explains cognition, okay. And of course, the question is, what are the basic data types? 
And what are the basic operations? Because we are talking about a computational system, we are, co 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 uh, we are talking about a language, okay? And uh, the question is, if you want to think about computation in the brain, which will be your, uh, you know, which is the level, okay? Of course, molecules. And of course, spike in neurons and synapses, okay? And people will tell you that the real computation happens in the dendrites of the neurons, okay? And then there is a whole brain computation because cognitive scientists, when they, um, when they uh, do experiments, they sometimes say, you see, the subjects acted as if they were, their brains were running, were running the following program, okay? So, so there is computation going on at the whole brain level. And there is a huge gap in between. So what is the, you know, what, what can you do there? Okay, what is, what is a computational system that will express this such that, so, you know, we, you know, we want, we want, we want something, we want a computational system which will explain what happens above, okay, and can be compiled to the machine language below. Okay, so, you know, this is, this is what we are looking for. Okay, so, and, okay, so, What's the assembly calculus? First of all, it is a formal probabilistic model of the brain. Okay, so you know, so uh, this should be uh, uh, happy food for you. Okay, so you know, it's 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 uh, you know, it is it is a it is a model of the brain. Okay, which is a formal model. So so uh, a basic <coughs> a basic data type, basic operations, a completeness theorem. And what we call a killer app, in this case, it's language, okay? So, <clears throat> and uh, there is a recent paper that uh, where we explain this uh, for neuroscientists, but I mean, no, but I think it's, it's also uh, useful reading for computer scientists, is, uh, is uh, a paper uh, titled, uh, just published, uh, by titled Computation by Assemblies of Neurons. Okay, good. So let me let me focus on the mathematical model of the brain. Okay, so here is here is what for the purposes of uh, of of, the, of building this logic. Here is what we are proposing that you should think, you can think that you have a license to think the brain as. It is a finite number of brain regions. Okay, think of them as about a hundred regions. Each of them contains n neurons maybe a few millions, and excitatory neurons. And uh, because of inhibition, and inhibition, of course, is the action of neurons who, whose work is, whose, uh, whose purpose and job is to keep neuro neurons from firing too much. Because of inhibition, we assume that only K of these neurons fire at any time. Some pairs of areas, these are the red arrows, are connected by directed GMP graphs. By bipartite GMP graphs. And all of them are connected recurrently by actual GMP graphs. So let's suppose that this is the brain, okay? It's a bunch of GMP graphs, and some of them are in pairs connected by directed bipartite GMP graphs, okay? Uh, all right. So more assumptions. Neurons fire in discrete steps, step one, two, three, four, five. Uh, think of every step as 20 milliseconds. The K neurons with highest synaptic input in each area are selected to fire. This is, this is a, an operation, this is an assumption that we call a random projection and cap. Okay, a random projection followed by selection. Okay, so only K neurons fire in every area. Connections, the red arrows, the connections between areas can be inhibited and disinhibited. And there is also plasticity. If there is a connection from I to J, I fires, and the next step J fires, the weight of IJ is increased, let's say, by 10%. And there are many other details that don't interfere much with our theorems. Okay. And... Uh, 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 Santos, you want to you want to you want to uh, uh, you want to add something here? No, this is great. Yeah. So the the the, the point is that it's it's very minimalistic in terms of the actual operation. There is a no um, algorithm except that each neuron is doing what it should, uh, and each uh, brain area has this uh, cap, which is uh, 
uh, enforced by inhibitory neurons. Good. So, I mean, so the, the intended values of the, of the main parameters in the next slide, uh, uh, you know, let's say that, that N is about 10 million and, uh, and uh, K is uh, maybe a few tens of thousands. Uh, and P is one in a thousand and beta, the, the plasticity is 10%. So what is the main idea, okay? The main idea is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, the main ideas, what, are, what is powering this, uh, this uh, brain, okay? Randomness, very powerful, as we all know, selection and plasticity, okay? In other words, powerful, uh, randomness, selection and learning. And the basic operation is, is what we call uh, random projections followed by cap. And in fact, there is an online simulator which you can, which you can play with. Okay, so you know, and, and uh, uh, what I love about the simulator is that the first, the first command you have to type is load brain. Okay, you know, so, and this, uh, you know, this is something that I, want, I feel like typing every morning, okay, when I wake up. Okay, so that's, that's uh, okay. Uh, and, uh, so, how realistic is it, okay? Do neuroscientists accept it? Of course not, okay? So, you know, you know it's, you know, there, there, there is, you know, of course, of course, it is, it is a huge uh, uh, formal, formalism of the brain, okay? So, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very extremely formal uh, 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 model of the brain, but, for a formal brain of the formal model of the brain, I believe it's very realistic. Okay, the discrete sex, sex assumption is certainly unrealistic because neurons fire uh, asynchronously, but we believe that it's not distortive. Okay, that 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 uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it keeps uh, the, the truth on the ground. Uh, Plasti so it's one its its main innovation. You know, neuroscientists know that plasticity happens and, and assemblies exist. Okay, these, these, these sets of neurons are called assemblies, the, the set of K neurons that fire. Uh, but here we are using them in a rapid time scale. Okay, we want to use them, let's say, at four hertz. Okay, and this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is something that, uh, that uh, 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 sort of uh, neuroscientists find novel. Okay, so you know that, you know, they, uh, uh, and they have not done, has not been done before. Uh, and we believe that it's a very productive compromise between realism, rigor, and usefulness. Okay, so you know, how useful it is, you will see next. Um, so what is the basic uh, data type that is larger than neuron and smaller than brain? And the answer is something that is called the assemblies. Okay, the assembly of neuron. And, uh, and uh, uh, the next slide. So, um, uh, by assemblies, we mean uh, uh, what is an assemblies? It's a large, large, maybe 30,000 uh, 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 excitatory neurons and densely interconnected. This, this sounds a little, uh, a little uh, strange to computer scientists. So, out of this random graph, we have selected a random set of neurons which happens to be far more densely connected. Than the than P than sort of you know what GMP guarantees. And the question is how is this done? Okay, so you know, and uh, and it has a beautiful answer. This question. Okay, you know, it turns out that by the way they're constructed, they're automatically dense, and uh, uh, and you know who's firing. So you know it's called an assembly. If firing this assembly in a pattern is tantamount to the subject's thinking of a particular memory, concept, person, name, word, episode, and so on, okay? And uh, uh, Yori Busaki, who is one of the greatest neuroscientists in the world and who actually is the one who discovered assemblies, uh, calls uh, in his uh, recent uh, and highly recommended uh, uh, popular book, uh, Assemblies, the alphabet of the brain, okay? Uh, you, the, the, old, the, the old folks among you remember that there was this, uh, this uh, thing between this dichotomy in AI, between symbolic and sub-symbolic AI, okay? So, I mean, it's not, it's not, this dichotomy exists in the brain and, and, and assemblies is where symbols start, okay? You know, it's, it's how symbols are represented in the brain, okay? So, for example, 
play cells are assemblies, okay? So, you know, the prim most primitive kind of assembly. Okay, and so here is, uh, here is uh, uh, what our hypothesis, our, our gamble, this is what we believe, that there is an intermediate level of brain computation. Let's call it the assembly calculus, and I'm going to define it. Uh, Santos is going to define it. It is implicated in higher cognitive functions, such as reasoning, planning, language, storytelling, math, music. And assemblies of neurons are its basic representation, its data type. Okay, so that's, this is what, this is, as I said, this is our hypothesis. Uh, and this is what we are pursuing in the paper that I showed you at, in our current work. Uh, next, uh, uh, and what are operations? And here they are, projection, uh, association, pattern completion, merge, and bind or reciprocal projection. And plus a couple of control commands to make it into a, programming language which for in which you can write while loops and if then else okay you know so that and and this is this is uh, this is the whole the whole uh, language uh, and uh, now i think uh, santos takes over thank you yeah super so so we've seen that uh, uh, the proposal is to have uh, this 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 setup where uh, assemblies are the data type large subsets of neurons. Let's think of them as subsets of neurons for now, but we will see that that definition might have to be generalized later. And, um, and, and now we want to do this computation somehow uh, innately using just these data types. Uh, so so how, how can this start? Our starting point will be uh, the, the, the humble fruit fly and its olfaction, uh, how it uh, 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 records memories of smells. So, the, so what we know about this system is that uh, when, when, when the fly encounters an odor, um, it has many different receptors that are tuned to specific types of uh, odors, you know, sort of simple types of hubel weasel cells, but just look, looking for odors. And some of them start firing depending on what it's encountering. Um, then there is this very interesting step where uh, these uh, roughly 50 neurons that are directly coming from uh, sensory neurons are expanded, projected into a much larger set of uh, about 2000 Kenyan cells. Each cell receives a, a, a weighted combination of the input uh, from, from, from the neurons. So the connection from the first layer to the second layer is this, uh, is this uh, relatively sparse bipartite graph, directed bipartite graph. And then there's this very interesting step where what's sent further up into the fly's brain is uh, not all of the, these 2000, uh, but roughly about a hundred of these. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, which hundred? The top hundred, the hundred that are receiving the highest input. So this is the system that biologists have figured out what happens. This also happens in other uh, organisms like locusts and so on. Um, so we're calling this random projection and cap. The random projection is to a higher dimensional space, not lower as one might often see in algorithms. And uh, and then and then uh, the cap is the is is uh, the top hundred winners. So it's the winners take all, uh, preceded by uh, random projection. So uh, uh, we want to think of this as the one of the basic operations that's happening in the brain and that's easy for the brain to implement. Uh, you know, the, the input that's going to be received by the second layer will roughly be a, a sum of, will be a sum of Bernoulli's a weighted sum and therefore look like a Gaussian and the cap operation is saying that you're going to take this, this, this tail of the Gaussian, that's all that survives. Okay, so, but wait a minute. This graph here, right? For, for this to be a random projection would need to be, the, the, the connectivity would need to be random. And is, the, is this really a random bipartite graph? And the answer as figured out also in Axel's lab is that indeed it actually looks like a random bipartite graph except with a skewed degree distribution. You know, the distribution is not uniform uh, for, the, for the degrees on, on the left, but, uh, but, but other than that, it is actually uh, 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 up to several order statistics, a uh, uh, random bipartite graph, great. So we can now uh, abstract this, this, this operation as follows. There's the left side and the right side. And uh, some subset of K uh, neurons, uh, nodes on the left are firing. So they're set to one. This represents the subset of the sensory neurons that are firing. And as a result, you know, we activate some subset of cells on the right, okay? Now it doesn't matter that the two subsets are equal size. We're just gonna assume that for simplicity. So, so A projects to cap A. Cap A is the winner uh, after this operation. And now we do this for a different uh, uh, subset B. That's the green subset here. 
So a different subset B is projecting to, uh, to, to, to some other subset here. Now here's a question. Suppose two of these, uh, these uh, original stimuli subsets overlap in some fraction of their nodes, say an alpha fraction. What's the overlap of the projections? Now we'd like that to be high. Why? Because then you know the, 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 the memories are similar. So if it sees similar smell, cells, smells, it recognizes them as similar and perhaps takes similar actions. Uh, that would make sense. And indeed, this is what is, 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 is observed, of course, in the fly, but also in an abstraction of this fruit fly algorithm by, by, by a team of computer scientists uh, and neuroscientists, uh, Sanjoy Dasgupta, Charles Stevens, and, 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 and Navlaka. Um, this was also an inspiration for us, where they showed that this, take this algorithm, this fruit fly algorithm, and run it for near neighbor search, you know, on, on, on some benchmark data sets, and it actually does very well, you know, comparable in, to, to limited versions of uh, locality sensitive hashing. So the question is, why is this happening? Why is this overlap getting preserved? And uh, 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 here's, here's uh, uh, what we were able to prove. So the intersection of these two caps, which are both of size K, right? If, you were, if they were totally random, you'd expect the intersection uh, uh, to, be, to be just K out of N. You know, you, 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 that, that's how many you're picking the second time. But instead it's in fact a, a higher, uh, you know, a, a smaller power, the intersection is higher, one minus alpha or one plus alpha which means that if there is a larger overlap to begin with, uh, it will project to an even larger overlap uh, in, the, in the next. Now we have a denominator factor in, 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 our, in our proof and we, we, we think that maybe the denominator is not needed. It'll, it'll need a more sophisticated uh, proof. So why is this happening? So what are we saying? You, know, you project a subset, you, you get some cap, that's, that's fine. The next time you project a subset which has an overlap and you want to get, say that you, you get a subset which has a large overlap with the first one. This is to be expected because you see, if you already have a subset that, 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 that uh, led to a cap, then the probability that a neuron is going to be in the second cap is positively correlated with being in a previous cap. You see, if you were already in a previous cap, that means you were receiving, uh, you know, your, your, your input was, was high from, from, from whatever was firing. Now you're not receiving all of that input, but you're receiving some subset of that input and you expect that this should give you a positive correlation. And indeed, this is exactly what, uh, what we can show uh, in, in, in assuming the, the graph is random. Okay, in simulations, um, you know, this, the, the lower bound that we, that we actually show is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 uh, is this uh, orange line here. The conjectured bound without the denominator is slightly higher. Now, when we run simulations, then we find that uh, the, the overlap is this blue line, okay? And then uh, uh, what we'll see later that a more complicated operations that happens in mammals and, 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 and humans is, uh, gives you an even more, even better overlap. And the black uh, straight line is the 45 degree uh, line, which exactly. would mean that it's- Perfect. Uh, perfect state. Okay, so, 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 so that's the, that was the first step. Okay, great. So the fruit fly is projecting and this random projection and cap operation is promising because it's preserving overlap. But now let's, let's, uh, let's, let's go to, 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 to mammals where something very important happens, which is that now in the right area, not only do you have connect a bipartite graph, but on the right part, you also have a, a graph there, a directed graph there. So there's a recurrent connectivity as they, as they call it, and importantly, plasticity. So the, the weight wedges in there can change. So here, here is what the, the, the process looks like. There is a sensory assembly, or you think of them as input neurons on the, on the left side of this line that fire. As a result, a subset of K, the, high, the, the K that received the highest input fire on the right. And then the left, subset on the left fires again. As a result, a second one uh, cap is formed. Why is that? You see, in the second step, both are firing. The, the sensory input is still on, plus these top K nodes that fired are also on. As a result, there, will, there could be a new top K. There will in general be a new top K. That's, that's the second set of winners. There might be some overlap, but there's a second set of winners. This happens again. And then there's now a third set of winners. So that's the process. Top K fire, there's a new top K, and you continue. So, so you see there, there's lots of questions here. Right? Does this process converge, for example? This is a mix of discrete and continuous operations. And, and does this, it's not at all clear that there's a fixed point. Uh, so what we were able to show is that assuming again, the connectivity is G and P, both, both in the bipartite graph and in the, in the, in the, in the recurrent graph, 
Uh, this process actually converges exponentially fast with high probability and converges in the following sense. If you look at the total number of cells that are ever activated, we're not saying that it will converge to a fixed set of K and that's the only thing that will fire at the end. Rather, what it's saying is that the total number of cells that will be activated at any point is going to be K plus little o of K, assuming that plasticity, so this beta is the plasticity parameter, which means that if I and J fire, then the connectivity, the, the weight of the edge from I to J goes up uh, by a factor of one plus beta, okay? That's, that's the plasticity part. In addition, there's homeostasis, which is just renormalization to make sure edges don't wait, don't go crazy, which just means that the total input weight to a neuron is periodically set back to a constant, say one. The total, the sum of the input weights is to a neuron is set back to one. So, uh, so above a certain plasticity, the total number of neurons touched is small, proportional to, a, a, I mean, almost the same as one assembly size. Below that, as long as it's positive, there is still some bound non-trivial bound. It can grow, but there's a non-trivial bound. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to you know, one, one, one clean open question here for, for, for the probabilist is whether there's a phase transition here, but we'll, we'll get to these questions in the third part of the talk. So that's the first part, but just to show this pictorially, what's happening is that if this, this plot here is showing you the number of um, new activations, number of new neurons that are, that are, that are uh, activated and it, you know, it drops off very quickly so that within a, within a dozen iterations, you, know, you have stability. You don't, you don't see any new, new ones, but we do see some interesting behaviors. Even at the end, there can be a few neurons that go back and forth or even little cycles, but most of it is the core is stable. And this is part of the reason why I was saying that you know, the definition of assembly doesn't have to be a subset of neurons. Maybe it's a distribution with a, which is concentrated on a small subset of neurons. This plot here on the left is showing what happens to this total support, the number of neurons that are activated at any point as a function of the plasticity. So as you increase the plasticity, it becomes stable very quickly. And as you go to plasticity zero, you know, it might, it, it, it might never get stable. It actually just goes around all over the place, uh, at least for GNP. Okay, so just in a couple of slides, since, since, since just if, if only to make clear that these are familiar methods to theoretical computer scientists, I'll, I'll, I'll sketch the, the proof of this convergence theorem. So what do we have? We have K neurons on the outside that are firing. And, because, and then uh, into some area. And that area, the top K start firing. So the ones that receive the highest input, that's the first cap. And then the second cap are the, one, the ones that fire will be those that receive the highest total input from the stimulus, the outside ones, plus the K that just fired. So what's gonna be the second cap? There is this competition between the K previous winners that are ahead because they get the most input from the, from the outside, plus a much larger pool of N neurons which are now also getting input from the ones that are firing inside. And so how does this, this, uh, this competition uh, play out? And so the way we analyze it is say, suppose these are the fractions of new winners at each step, okay? So at the very beginning, everybody's new, new one, new zero is one, but then, you know, there's some fraction. And we'd like to show this fraction of new, new winners is decaying. If you told me what the fraction of new winners is, then I could figure out what the threshold is because the graph is random. I can tell you what the threshold must be for the input received so that you had exactly this number of new winners. And that's what I wrote down here. And now, once you have these thresholds, the, the, the argument goes like this. In the second step for a neuron to stay in the cap, the one that was already, that already fired, it better have received input higher than this cap value. But, you know, it gets a little help. Not only did it receive, uh, you know, uh, higher than the first cap, because that's why it was in the first cap, that weight also went up by the plasticity, by, by, by plasticity, one by one plus beta. So now it, it needs that whatever its weight from the input times one plus beta plus what it's receiving randomly from the firing of the assembly within this new area should exceed the second threshold. This, this, is, this, is, this is the probabilistic equation. And, and this, is, this determines the threshold, what we call beta star, which is just a lower bound in our case. Not, not, I don't know that that's, the, that's a threshold in that sense. And, um, and, 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 and once you survive one cap, once a winner survives, it's more and more likely to survive because the weight on it gets boosted exponentially. So that's, that's the sketch of the proof. Now here's the very interesting thing that happens. And you could ask, okay, so why are mammals and humans bothering with assemblies? Projections seem to work just fine for, uh, for fruit flies. And, and the reason is this. You see, what we'd like is that a future presentation of the same or similar stimulus fires mostly the same assembly. So that happens with overlap, great. 
But what if you just fire a subset of it? Not all of it, but you fire a subset of the assembly for some reason. You'd like to then ignite the entire assembly. You know, you have a small uh, prompt and you want to figure out, the, have the whole assembly ignite. So this is what neuroscientists call pattern completion. And indeed this holds for assemblies created by this uh, repeated uh, recurrent process. Uh, indeed for any uh, epsilon, if you fire only an epsilon fraction and you'd like it to go to most of the assembly, all you need is that the number of initial presentations uh, goes, goes up with log of one over epsilon. And, and, and the reason is because the area that's defined by the assembly, the subset here, will also inherit expansion. And, and so once you have a small constant fraction, it'll, it'll spread out to the, to the rest. And this is a clear provable, be provable benefit of uh, recurrent connections over plain uh, fruit fryer like projections. Okay, so that was the first operation, projection, you know, where you're able to take an assembly from one area and project it to another area in a stable way. The second operation is association, something that's also uh, very familiar in cognition. You know, if there are two stimuli that co-occur, you see them together, they already have things occurring in them. You know, there's a photograph and a person, and suddenly you start seeing them together, you build an association in your head. And what, we're, in the language of assemblies, that means that their overlap increases. You know, there are already subsets of neurons with some small overlap. Their overlap and the connection strength between them increases. That's, that's the second operation. And to illustrate this, we go through one, a very influential experiment um, uh, from 2016, from, uh, Ison et al. And here's what they did. They were recording from several hundred neurons uh, in, the, in, the, in the NTL and uh, uh, in, in, in live uh, human patients. And uh, 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 they were presenting them images and seeing which neurons were firing. So for example, they would show them uh, an image of a place, a familiar place, and they'd see that certain neurons, some subset of neurons were consistently firing. Different place, a different subset of neurons firing, great. Then people, familiar people. <laughs> uh, and, uh, 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 and then again, there would be some subset of neurons firing with, with some small overlap. Because remember, assemblies that don't have to be disjoint subsets of neurons, of course. They can be uh, overlapping subset neurons. And uh, so there's some small overlap. Okay, but then they would do this thing where they would present these images together for some time. Okay, and there would be some firing. And then later they would present only one of the images. And guess what? Some of the neurons that previously fired only for the person would also be firing now. Okay, so in the process of actively presenting both stimuli together, you observe that the assemblies increase their overlap uh, as measured on a cell-by-cell -cell neural recording. Okay, so, so that, that's what, that's what uh, we just did. And so association actually also provably happens in the assembly model with the GNBA assumption. Its proof is a, is, a, is, a, is a small extension of the proof of convergence we just went over. Perhaps the most complicated operation in this setup is merge where you already have two assemblies and you'd like to create a new assembly that sort of captures the operation of both of these, where if one of them fires, then the, the merged assembly also fires, but also signals the other component of this merge. And this, this merge operation was explicitly identified uh, by uh, Berwick and Chomsky and other linguists as being critical uh, uh, or, or as a way to explain parsing and generation of language. Um, yeah, so this, this is what's getting, getting happening now. Uh, we don't have a proof of this. We have several steps. So this, is, this is one very uh, detailed and open question. We'll get there. But just to go back to the assembly calculus itself, we have the operations project, associate, pattern complete, we just saw that, merge, which I only described at a high level, plus a few control commands, which might be, you know, activate an assembly or read what is happening in that area. Or um, if you look at the bipartite connections as Chris has described between two areas, we can choose to inhibit or disinhibit entire uh, area or connection, the entire bipartite graph. And that's about it. And now you can ask, you know, to com with, the, with, with all of these as a computational system, how powerful is this? You know, just, just, uh, just as a, you know, to compare with Turing machines. And what we can show is that it can in fact perform arbitrary square root and space computations under some assumptions of synchronicity and, uh, so on. What do we mean by this? If you have n areas with n neurons and you only need a constant number of such areas, then you can perform any uh, uh, square root and Turing machine, square root and space Turing machine computation. And in particular, this means that uh, you know you, you can do uh, 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 
a large uh, parallel depth computation. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Christos for uh, what uh, we call uh, the killer app. Great. Okay. So um, we we are we are um, close to the end of this segment. So I'll I'll walk you quickly through uh, the last and perhaps most fascinating part of this uh, of what we have done, which is trying to understand language. Okay. Because uh, uh, I hope you realize that what's happening now is incredibly uh, mysterious. Okay. So you know that that. Uh, uh, the the way the, the air waves that I produce in my room uh, come to you and you interpret them as uh, as language. Okay, so you know, so uh, uh, long. I uh, mean, you know, so you, if you, you want to advance, uh, uh, so why study language? You know, neuroscientists don't like the idea of studying language. Okay, because they say this is the the hardest thing that brain, any brain has ever done. Why study this? Why do we wait until we have a better understanding. The point, our point is that language is uh, sort of, you know, is something that is 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 a trait that uh, is very recent. Uh, it was, it has evolved while our brain was in full development, and as a result, uh, it can tell us a lot about the brain. And it's it's a, it's a missed opportunity if we do you know study language. And in fact, there are some amazing experiments that uh, that. Um, uh, that that we have seen recently. Uh, you want you want you want to go through the, the, the Popper's experiment quickly. I mean, so you know, basically what he did is uh, is he presented to patients uh, uh, at four hertz uh, uh, words, single syllable words in six different languages that were not uh, that that uh, that were just independent words, made no sense together. And then he took the data, and of course he found that there is a that there is a there is a peak at four hertz in this data, in this fMRI and echo data. Then he repeated the same thing, but cleverly he made every every four words make sense now. Okay, and uh, what he what he what they saw is that now there is a there is there are four three peaks at four hertz because four times every second you need to fetch a fetch a word. But then at one hertz, which means that every well, once every second you create a sentence, and then at two hertz, because these sentences each one breaks down to two phrases, and so twice every second you have to create a phrase, and this convinces me. If you go further, that uh, convinces us that basically what is happening here is that is that at four hertz trees are created. Okay, so you know, and if you remember the operation merge that we presented. This operation, what it does, it creates the internal node of a tree that has the two original assemblies as a leaf. So, could it be that all this thing is happening through assemblies? Okay, so you know, and we want to prove that yes, it can be happening through assemblies. Okay, so let's, let's uh, and uh, and of course you can see that these three operations uh, must be happen at a dozen spikes per step. Okay, why dozen? Because neuron spikes are about 50 hertz. Language is about four hertz, therefore you only have a dozen spikes to do all this. And the point is that uh, assembly projections are dozen spikes. Okay, so that's uh, uh, and so here are more experiments. Okay, so, you know they 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 read uh, to subjects uh, phrases like the ball hit the track and the track hit the ball, and they notice that different areas of the superior temporal gyrus responded to track in the two sentences. This is as if the brain. Uh, has a different area for object and different area for subject. Okay, well, well, which is which is extremely telling. I mean, so let's 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 go further. Uh, and then the completion of phrases and especially of sentences activates parts parts of Broca's area, which is the area of the brain, which we have known for about hundred years that it seems to be responsible for syntax, for syntactic analysis uh, and synthesis of sentences. Okay, so all these sort of, you know, tell us that this is sort of, you know, that that's the language organ, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, the purple part, the MTL, is where the lexicon resides, Wernicke's area is where word selection happens, and Broca's area is where the tree is being built. Okay, so, you know, this is, this is what, Many many uh, cognitive scientists study, studying uh, language have believed. Okay, so you know, but the question is, there was always 
you know, they had a static picture, okay? So, you know, and what we are showing is that assemblies are basically the missing ingredient to complete this picture, okay? So let, let, me, let, let me show you, uh, let me show you, and this, is, this will be the end of this, of this part. Uh, how assemblies can, uh, can uh, be the agents for the creation of trees, okay? So, you know, of creation of syntax trees, because of course, uh, a sentence is processed in many ways, but many people who study language in the brain uh, are uh, convinced that syntax comes first, okay? So, you know, that first we figure out uh, the sort of the approximate uh, syntactic superficial structure of the sentence, and then we attack the different semantic problems that the, sen that the sentence presents. So, so let's talk about generation. In, in other words, parsing is important. We are working on parsing, okay? So, you know, but but let's 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 talk about the more fundamental problem, which is generation. What is the basic operation of language? And if you think about it, what is the basic thing that language does? And I believe, and many linguists agree with me, that the basic operation that that uh, that the basic language operation that we do is that we observe an image, like the image you see here, or an image you imagine, or an image that never happened because you are lying, okay? So, you know, but the point is that you, you have an image in your brain, and from this image, you extract its main uh, ingredients. What was done, who did it, and to what, okay? So, basically, you look at the image, and your brain looks searches for in the MTL, in the lexicon, for the appropriate word, hit, strike, kick, kick. Okay, so you know, that's, that's, and then this is projected to the verb area of the Wernicke's area. Now you are looking who, okay, kid, girl, boy, boy. All right, I mean, so, and this is also projected to the subject area of, uh, of Wernicke's area. And then ball, uh, you find the word and you project it, okay? And of course, these three operations, there is no reason why they don't happen simultaneously, okay, in parallel. So this is just one step, one projection step. And now you have in place in the, the, three, the three ingredients, okay? Boy, kick and ball. Next, you create this merge between kick and ball and you create the verb phrase, kick ball. And finally, this verb phrase is merged with the boy and, uh, and creates uh, the whole sentence uh, in the uh, second part, in the part of Pericularis, as it's called, of Broca's area. Okay, so in the upper part is Broca's area. So, and that uh, now you have in your brain a complete rendering of the sentence, the boy kicks the ball. Okay, you know, and now, of course, you have to articulate it. Okay, so how is this done? Well, first of all, what you do is you start firing the S node, the S assembly, the sentence assembly, and this creates an avalanche of firings, and eventually the three words in the green area will fire, okay? Uh, why is that? Because, 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 uh, because of these connections are two-way. And of course, if you speak English, boy will come out first, and then kick and then ball. But if you, if you speak uh, uh, Latin, then boy will come first, then ball, then kick. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that this is, and we, when we're two years old, we learn to do what our, you know, among these, these, these six options, we learn what our mother teaches us. Okay, so, uh, uh, and, and eventually, uh, this, uh, the, the, boy, the, the assemblies in the lexicon are going to be uh, excited. And uh, as a result, they're going to mobilize the, uh, the, uh, uh, the motor uh, programs that are needed for articulation of the words. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a, in a nutshell, how we believe that assemblies are filling sort of, you know, the gaps in, in, in our understanding of, of language and, uh, uh, and their operations. It can explain uh, 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 the uh, how syntax, you know, how language, how the most, uh, the most, uh, the, the, the simplest part of language uh, can happen. Okay, the syntax.
Excellent. So, um, uh, uh, assemblies and their operations, we are, proposing, uh, we are proposing them as one productive path to thinking about computation in the brain. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, our main contribution is to show that uh, they can explain uh, the parts of, uh, uh, of uh, language processing that uh, were uh, mysteri henceforth mysterious uh, to the students of language in the brain. Uh, there are many open theoretical problems that our work has left. Uh, and of course, the important open questions is, uh, are assemblies uh, what Axel is looking for, okay? Uh, and uh, I have not dared ask him yet, okay? You know, uh, you know so, um, and uh, how can one test, verify or falsify the assembly hypothesis. And with Santos and uh, two cognitive scientists from uh, CUNY, the City University of New York, we have a joint grant, which uh, when the virus permits, will allow us to uh, do uh, human experiments uh, involving language uh, in order to um, uh, test some of the predictions that, uh, that the assembly hypothesis does about, about uh, language processing in the brain. So that's, that's uh, I think I ran over my time, but uh, apologies. But uh, uh, so this is officially the break and I'll be delighted to, uh, uh, ooh, Santos and I would love to have your questions. Uh, I did answer a couple of questions. Uh, uh, so uh, let me, let me, let me, um, let me jump in with uh, with uh, with uh, somebody is asking about sign language, uh, Nashad. Uh, uh, of course, yes. Yeah. So so uh, 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 this is a very very widely studied studied subject in, in linguistics and in and in um, uh, uh, language in the brain, and um, it is believed that uh, 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 sign language is. Uh, exactly like all languages, except it has a rather novel uh, input device, okay? Other than that, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, I mean, you know, some African languages have clicks, uh, uh, sign language goes a little further than that, okay? You know, so, so you know, other than that, it's, it's a complete language that, uh, that is treated by the brain uh, exactly as, as other languages are treated. Uh, I have a few questions. Oh. Uh, so, I mean, you know, sound information theory, of course, of course. I have a few questions please. and uh, I ahead. don't know, like, uh, where can I find you to ask the questions? Uh, uh, you can ask the questions. Uh, here or you said the, in the break. Here, 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 no, 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 here, here. So regarding the sign language, you said uh, it has a different input. So I was wondering, like, uh, one of the different, like about the sign language and the real language, there are two different things. For example, uh, I started learning a little bit of sign language and I've noticed that they're not using many of their regular way of communication. For example, they're um, not using the quantifiers like A and D or lots of these things. Uh, sometimes they define a concept with a specific sign. And um, so when you showed the, uh, uh, excuse me. I mean, sorry for interrupting, but but uh, but uh, yes. I mean, you know, sign language is incredibly well studied. Okay, so you know there are there are hundreds of books, so you know, in linguistics about sign language. Okay, yes, yes it's, but, it's it's very well studied. But when you showed the brain of the map, like when different parts are like for the different uh, I mean, for different. Uh, yes, I yes, wanted to yes. say that uh, they're using rather than uh, their their tongue, they're mainly also using their hands. So I was wondering if many, if might be there another part of the brain that used to store like some part of language that you have yeah. not mentioned on that slide. I believe uh, the consensus uh, on this, uh, consensus of this exists and is that not? No, uh, there is very little difference in the way that, uh, that, uh, that uh, sign language is, is uh, between the way sign language is processed by the language organ than other languages. Uh, you know, it is it is just an extremely novel input problem. You know, and and uh, you know, uh, the brain is incredibly versatile. 
Okay, so you know, so uh, it's going, you know, it's going to realize that these are these are words, and we'll put them in the right place in in the lexicon, um, and and we'll 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 get used to to uh, to uh, uh, deal with the, with the, um, uh, with the, with the peculiarities of, of signal language of sign language. So um, uh, I mean. Sign language, so you know, I know it's difficult. I mean, but but but, uh, and my students ask this again and again. But no, it's it's a language, okay? So you know, it's 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 like all languages. May I ask one more question about the Please. real language? So regarding your question that uh, you try to relate the kickball and how this like combination come to mind for people who uses the real language. So for example, the grass is green, and most of the time we don't use this like. Uh, we don't explain that all the time, but it implies in our mind because we see that. So there is a, another way of input. But for people who cannot see that, maybe that relation is not forming in their mind. So maybe they're, they're having a different grasp of these things. That's what I'm trying to say. Maybe there is another part that is activated in order to relate things for them. Is it possible that there are other uh, parts? That okay, your, your, bra your brain handles green, you know, in the two in very different ways than my brain handles green. Okay, so you know, but but this is not is this is not uh, a big issue. I mean, you know, so and and you know, there are concepts that you have that I never formed because of you know I, I didn't have the experiences that you. Uh, uh, so you know, this does not uh, you know people are in incredibly different. Okay, so you know, and and. Uh, I mean, just to just to but, emphasize that. See, the point is that if you if you take a a baby from Japan and you raise it in London. I mean, she will speak with 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 English accent, or English with with an with a British accent. Okay, you know. So the the you know don't, we shouldn't underestimate how versatile a brain is. Okay, that's um... yeah. So these parse trees that uh, Christos was forming, they form very differently for not only different languages but even different brains. I mean, even very simple things like learning to walk. Or navigate uh, different environments. We 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 might do it in completely different sequences of the same overall operation. So the flexibility is there at at, at all levels of. So you know, yes, I mean, no, the, the the universality and sort of you know, and also the, the uniformity of language is, is is miraculous. But also there is a lot of diversity in language. Okay, so you know, we all speak. At, you know, when we speak English, uh, we speak a very very you know different version of English. And sort of, you know, and uh, this is how languages evolved. I mean, you know, you know if, okay, are you ready? You know, this is mind boggling, okay? So, you know, you take, you take, you take a, a child in Japan, okay? Two island, two island children, right? I mean, a, Chinese, a child in Japan and a child in England, okay? They speak very different languages. These two different languages are the result, the differences between these two languages are the result of uh, small differences that 4,000 mothers introduced in teaching their children what their mothers taught them. Okay, so the difference between English and Japanese is due to 4,000 mothers who uh, did tiny uh, changes in the way uh, they taught the language to their children that they learned from, from their own parents, okay? Uh, so, uh, I mean, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible mystery, you know, that, that, is, that is sort of, you know, the more you think about it, you know, the more you admire it. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it is the, the it is the, uh, uh, the I peak, think I understand, the peak, but it is the peak of what our brain, our brain has accomplished. Okay, you know, so, so you know, of course, we should admire it and not completely understand it. We, so we have a question about uh, about uh, GNP, which I can. It's, it's asking: Is the assumption of random graph really compatible with the distribution of degrees of neurons? It's a very good question. We'll get to this uh, in some detail in the last part. Uh, you know, uh, departures from GNP and how both they seem to occur in the brain and how one might uh, both model them and show that they're beneficial. So we'll, we'll get to this. There's one more question that maybe Crystal, you can answer, which is about languages, uh, which is, can all languages be modeled with information theory? 
and uh, um, yes okay so you know yes uh, of course uh, uh, and and i guess uh, the question is what do you get out of this so you know i don't uh, i mean let me tell you what what uh, you know uh, languages have uh, uh, famously have zip distributions of 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 uh, uh, word frequencies and uh, the word length uh, respect uh, sort of uh, correspond to these frequencies and this is explained by information theory and this uh, also uh, there are experiments where um, uh, they create robots that must communicate and 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 in, in complex environments and they do come up with the zip distributed uh, uh, notations um, so yes, okay. There is there is a lot, uh, you know. There is there has been a lot of, of course, sort of you know, uh, information theory. Shannon, uh, in his paper, he has uh, his uh, forty-page paper. Five pages are about language. Okay, you know. So so um, uh, yes, I mean, you know, information theory and langu language go together. Uh, but um, I think that the core of uh, of, of uh, the intricacy and beauty of language is not information theory. So I, I propose a two minute break before we resume the, the last part. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask a oh, question. Oh yeah, go for it. I'm, I've yeah. been waiting to ask a question. Please do. Um, so in, in computer, uh, this sort of goes to the beginning of, of the talk, uh, way before you started talking about language. Uh, in computer systems, uh, we're used to having uh, many levels of, ab of abstraction, uh, say between the hardware level and some sophisticated application like Zoom that is running on the computer. Uh, here, uh, you uh, basically have two levels, right? Neurons and then assemblies. And maybe neurons can be subdivided a little bit further, but uh, be beyond neurons, uh, you have only one level of abstraction. So why do you assume the brain has only one intermediate level of abstraction? Um, what can I say? I mean, no, the only, the only, the, I mean, good question. Um, the only evidence I have, the only, I mean, no, why do we think that this is a plausible way or the plausible thing? And the, the only, the only, uh, uh, okay. I mean, no, we have these two different levels, layers, the cognition and neurons, okay? And uh, we come up with the intermediate level and we show that you can explain uh, cognition sort of, you know, with this. So, you know, and that you can compile it down to neurons. Okay, so maybe, maybe there's a different compiler that uses a few intermediate uh, uh, assembly languages. Oops, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, but, but uh, you know, how are we called, so, you know, Code generator, code generators, and things like that. Okay, so you know that that are intermediate abstractions. But I mean, no. But in principle, it's you know we know we know how to how to compile it down to neurons. But but also, okay. well, we we can have uh, you know like for example the mode operation, you can have hierarchies of these assemblies. You know, uh, so okay. there are there are sort of higher level primitives in the language, which you know so. I, I, we didn't get a chance to do this. I thought in the de in this I could demo this thing with the, the thing that Chris was talking about: load brain project from area A, a to area B, you know, merge mm -hmm. assemblies. So once you write it at that level, you're not even referring to uh, to sort of neurons anymore at all. It's just mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. There, there there is there is more abstraction uh, uh, already inherent, but would be great to investigate. Yeah. Thank you. Is there uh, time for another question, or should I? Yeah, wait I, it? I think at this point we we can uh, forego the break. Yeah, we, we, uh, we'll start two more questions and we'll start the third point. Yeah, go for it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Good. Uh, so let me suggest another like killer app that I was wondering. Okay, so let me just give some context. Basically, with some collaborators, I have been working on you know, can you use machine learning to learn some simple algorithms? Now, you know, very quickly, this will lead to questions, okay, how do humans do it? How does the brain work and similar? Now, I mean, I don't know any neuroscience, but you know, my, the main reason I came to this talk is maybe, you know, your framework helps uh, to develop some novel learning algorithms. So, you know, it turns out that in machine learning, you cannot really find general input, you know, general methods to solve complex input output tasks. So let me give a few examples. 
I don't know, I give you a few examples how to increment a number, like incrementing uh, nine is 10, incrementing five is uh, whatever, six, incrementing some other number is some other number. I give you a bunch of examples, can you learn how to do it? I give you a bunch of examples how to add two numbers, can you learn how to do it? I give you first name and a last name, you learn how to get the initials out of it and such similar tasks. Like, would it be possible, you know, to use your brain assembly framework to actually design a learning procedure that will like solve this kind of simple input output tasks? And if it does, you know, this would go a long way towards convincing me and I'm sure many other people that, you know, this is the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> Good. Uh, we, we will have a large sort of component of learning with assemblies in the next part, you know, both supervised and unsupervised. And you, you, you know, the, the simple sort of parsing tasks you're talking about are certainly would be great to, are not that far from what we see the brain doing. So it'd be nice to explain them formally. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Um, so I guess I guess we'll we'll uh, we'll get started. Uh, uh, and 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 also, please uh, feel free to interrupt during the talks. You don't have to wait till the end uh, at any point, whenever whenever you'd like. So, um, I will project uh, uh, our, our um, uh, the last part, and um, uh, Christos will start again, and I'll take over at some point. Okay, all yours, Chris. Uh, advance. Okay, so we're going. We're going to uh, have uh, tell you about a few uh, directions, starting with directions related to assembly calculus, and I'm going to talk about that, and then and then uh, uh, Santos is going to tell us about the others. So you can you can. Uh, uh, so. Um, so uh, can can we see the can we see the full list? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, 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 you know the the first and the fourth part have to do with the assembly calculus. The others are independent and and, and outside it and, and uh, of course supporting it. Uh, and and uh, the last one is essentially at the interface with machine learning. Okay, so uh, is there, so Santos mentioned this, is there a phase transition uh, uh, with, uh, with assembly, assembly uh, uh, projection? So, you know, is there a phase transition? We, right now, we know we have uh, the beta star as a lower bound. We don't know exactly where uh, uh, the pessimistic, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the pessimistic bound starts uh, happening. Um, okay, uh, so we say that uh, it's, uh, that, you know, we told you that uh, the projection converges. It does not, okay? Rarely what you have is, uh, is uh, uh, a projection oscillates between two heavily overlapping sets, okay? Can't it be oscillated between many heavily overlapping sets? Could it be that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, the sets are not even heavily overlapping? And uh, what other possible with no vanishy, uh, no vanishy probability that is limited behaviors are there to assemblies. Okay, this is something that we, that, uh, that we haven't investigated. It uh, looks like a very rich uh, area for, uh, for um, uh, random graph theory. Okay, so um, uh, uh, ultimately, we may have to define assemblies as distributions over the n neurons in the area that have uh, small support uh, near K. Uh, and what are the modeling and mathematical challenges there? Okay, so, so um, uh, the, you know, the bitter truth is that uh, assemblies are the, the foundations of, of our edifice and we don't quite know what they are. Okay, you know, so that's, that's uh, 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 there, there, are, uh, there are conceptual and mathematical challenges uh, already at the definition of assemblies. Um, okay, so 
uh, it would be fantastic. It would strengthen uh, our uh, faith in assemblies. Uh, if uh, you can prove uh, projection in less stylized models, for example, when uh, uh, there is a synchronous firing or when you actually model the interaction between uh, uh, abstract neurons that are both inhibitory and uh, another population that is excitatory and uh, still convergence happens. Instead of having random projection in CAP, to have an explicit inhibition. So this is uh, this is, this will result in a more complicated probabilistic model that is that is the, that uh, that uh, we believe uh, can be analyzed and the analysis would support that uh, that the the assembly assembly convergence uh, of the projection operation. Okay, um, we are. We are using GNP, which of course is the cheap way, right? I mean, no, because you can prove everything on GNP. But I mean, no, could uh, could the same uh, uh, results proved by some kind of uh, uh, local expansion uh, uh, property, less uh, you know, which which of course follows from GNP, but is uh, but is but does not need the GNP. Um, so departures of, from GMP, and we're going to talk about that uh, 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 in the brain, are well known. Uh, uh, and they seem to help convergence, but the question is by how much, okay? It would be very interesting to, um, to quantify that convergence is helped, is sped up. Uh, and I, I believe that it is by uh, uh, departures from GMP in the brain. Uh, and also, uh, many people, information theorists usually ask, what is the capacity of an air in assemblies? Okay, sort of, you know, and, and, and uh, this is an interesting question which we have not fathomed. Okay, so, you know, so what is the limited factor? Uh, and, and what is capacity mean here? Okay, so, you know, it, uh, it will have to do with what you are using assemblies with. Okay, so, you know, so that's four. And this is, and this is, uh, 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 so, we have not we have not gone in this direction. Okay, uh, can you show the whole slide? Yeah. So uh, we assume assume for example, I mean, from experiments we know that when assemblies are associated, uh, uh, then uh, about ten percent they overlap by about by about ten percent. Imagine that associated you know, that. Two as two, you know, so let's define two sets are associated, two sets of size k, subsets of n uh, are associated if uh, they overlap by 10% and they're not, you know, by at least 10%. And we know that if they are not associated, that's a promise problem, they are overlapping less than 5%. Okay. So, for example, in this figure, uh, uh, green and blue are associated. Uh, green, uh, green, uh, green. Uh, sorry, green and red are associated. Red and blue are associated, but uh, green and blue are not associated. And uh, the question is, uh, what are the association graphs that can be represented in an area for a given n and k and alpha? Okay, and uh, and that's a very interesting mathematical problem which we have, we have partially attacked. So you know there is a, there is a paper. Uh, uh, it turns out that uh, that. Uh, 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 you uh, uh, you can solve it through the ellipsoid algorithm, but you reduce it the wrong direction. You reduce it to a non-hard problem, okay? Which happens to be the cut norm problem. We, you know, uh, an amazingly profound problem in, in graph theory. And uh, for partial results on this problem, and, uh, and also in terms of the composition algorithm for uh, uh, approximating a generalization, we have a paper with Santos and several others in. Uh, New RIPs uh, two, three years back. Um, so association and pattern completion uh, could be the basis of a very different style, style of um, uh, uh, explicitly probabilistic computation through assemblies. Okay, so uh, you know, in some sense, that you know, the the 
you know, our Turing machine simulation does not use association and pattern completion, okay? So, you know, there seem to be a different uh, instruction set, okay? And they seem to be the instruction set of a beautiful computation where basically what you compute is uh, sort of, you know, so by, by exploiting the associations in a way that encodes uh, Bayesian reasoning, uh, you are able to do your, uh, to, to, to compute uh, sort of in an interesting ways that you cannot imagine now. Uh, so, um, uh, changes in the basic models model will be needed. For example, you should be able to fire fewer than K uh, uh, occasionally uh, neurons in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in an area for this to start making sense. So this is uh, something that we have not, uh, we have not explicitly modeled, but I believe that it's a beautiful, uh, or, uh, beautiful opportunity for um, uh, a completely different kind of computation, which uh, also, so, you know, would be, would be uh, cognitively uh, powerful. Uh, so the power, you know, so that in the Turing machine simulation, basically, uh, you have uh, you have two tape areas. So in tape areas have these these square assemblies that uh, stand for the tape square, and basically uh, uh, the there is a symbol area which has uh, let's say zero and one, the red and green, and uh, then there is a tape symbol area which creates a merge with between the tape square assembly and uh, the appropriate symbol. And this is how every tape every tape square remembers its symbol, okay? And this is how the Turing machine computes. And there are several issues here. So, uh, for example, uh, are we sure that after the new merge with green, the, can you go for one, one more, one more? Uh, there was no, okay. Uh, are we sure that this old, uh, old connection with red was forgotten? Okay, so, you know, experiments show that it is. Okay, so you know, but but uh, but we don't have a proof. Okay, so you know, so uh, this is called obli the oblivious merge assumption, right? I mean, you know, and we need it for uh, for uh, for the Turing machine simulation, and also the tape area is crowded. Does the assembly of projection keep working square root of n times? Here's what we mean: that uh, that uh, we have uh, fantastic, very powerful proofs for uh, projection when the area of where it's projected is uh, pristine. So, you know, has never been touched before. After the first projection happens, suppose that you will do a second and a third and, and maybe a hundred projection. So, I mean, you know, we don't quite know, we do, don't quite have done the math, what happens then, okay? So, you know, so uh, uh, the square root of n uh, Turing machine simulation, space Turing machine simulation relies on an assumption that uh, these things don't create too much trouble. If we have want to be very conservative, square root of n becomes fourth root of n. Okay, so and then you can be sure that uh, with high probability there is minimal interference between uh, subsequent projections. Um, okay, so uh, so uh, uh, as I said before, the the space square root of n result. Uh, is uh, you know relies on Turing machine simulation and depends on assumption the non-interference assumption that I mentioned uh, uh, for you know for sub successive successive uh, projection and oblivious in assumption for the merge. Okay, the fourth core rook uh, you know is a weaker assumption. So so it's 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 uh, in fact no assumptions at all essentially and uh, can be these assumptions uh, justified rig rigorously. More importantly, we are interested, okay, so, you know, we can simulate Turing machines, okay? Not impressive, okay? You know, the brain, we don't know very few things about the brain. One thing we're sure about it is that it does not carry, Turing, carry out Turing machine computations, okay? So the question is, what practical algorithms can be out, carried out by the assembly calculus? Right now, we're working with the linguists uh, we are writing a parser for English based on assemblies. Okay, you know, so that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, but I mean, you know, what other practical algorithms can be carried out by the assembly calculus? That's, that, that's, that's a wonderful uh, arena for further research. Uh, and also, 
Are there are other plausible and useful operations of the assembly calculus? Okay, so I mean, you know, when you want to add an operation to a language like the assembly calculus, you have to think twice, okay, because it has to be plausible in the sense that uh, it uh, it can be compiled down to neurons and and and, and uh, synapses, and also has to be useful in the sense that. It can explain some cognitive phenomena. Okay, so you know, if it's not useful, then why add it? Okay, that's uh, so. And what are the, the operations that we have who have not noticed yet? Okay, so you know that's that's uh, 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 that's something that that uh, that uh, uh, we are thinking about. But uh, but uh, we would love to invite you to think about also. Okay. So, uh, you know, those were problems directly related to the assembly calculus and its uh, power and extensions and applications. Um, let's go back to uh, 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 a problem which is inspired by that, but maybe perhaps of completely independent interest. This was the process that, that, that uh, the abstract process that we studied. You, know, you have a graph and in this graph there are, at the start, there are K random vertices, K out of N random vertices that are firing. So let's say, a vertex is either zero or one, one if it's firing. So there's a subset of K that's firing. Uh, it's an edge-weighted graph, maybe directed. And then we repeat the following operations. Uh, there's a firing step, and then there's a step where every vertex, the weight it receives is the sum of the weights of incoming edges from firing vertices. So it's just, what is the total uh, incoming weight? And then now everybody has a weight and the top K vertices fire. So this is exactly our process in the, in the in a recurrent network. Top K fire, there's a new, new set of weights for everybody, top K fire again, and this is repeated. Does this process converge is the question, or when does it converge? And in GNP, the answer is yes, assuming that edge weights, there is also synaptic plasticity, right? If I and J fire, J fire soon after I or in the same round, then it must be that the, the, the weight of the edge is increasing. Under this assumption, yes, GNP, it converges. But you could ask, you know, on what graphs does this process converge without plasticity? So it's a, it's a natural uh, question here. And so by in our, in our language, the beta, the plasticity parameter is zero. And the conjecture of one such class of graphs which might capture this is geometric random graphs uh, where edges are already um, uh, with higher probability when, when, when the underlying uh, points are closer to each other in some metric. So one way to formalize this is to say vertices are assigned random values, let's say in an interval or a square, uh, which could be higher dimensional or some, some, some nice region. And then the probability of an edge existing is just depends on the distance between points. This is a well-studied model. People have proven lots of interesting things about this already. And now if we run this process, will this have an advantage over GNP? And empirically, the answer seems to be yes. That in fact, uh, the assembly projection um, is uh, converges efficiently. And uh, let me show you uh, this little GIF that uh, a first year PhD student here, Mira Bilreed created. Um, you now here there are 10,000 vertices whose chosen uniformly randomly in the square. Our cap size is 100. Edge probabilities is according to this Gaussian graph or Gaussian kernel. And we choose uh, only 1% of edges to be actual edges. And you can see that there is convergence and it converges to a fixed subset very quickly. Uh, so, so, so prove this, is the first question. And then here now with no plasticity, somehow it's mathematically even cleaner. And you could talk about phase transitions with, for example, the, the variance of the Gaussian or, or, or the region. Another interesting aspect here is that, you know, we've modeled these as the points as having features that are geometric, purely geometric, right? Euclidean square. Okay, so that might capture some geometry of the, of the, of the brain, it's three dimensional after all, or maybe even two dimensional if you think of it as, 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 as this folded napkin, but uh, there's more to it, right? We could also think of the, the, these latent uh, uh, features for each vertex of the graph to be some set of features that depend on other, other characteristics. You know, is it this kind of neuron? Is it, uh, does, does it have this length of axon? Does it lie in this region and so on? And so we're now talking about a totally non-Euclidean setup, but you could still define edge probabilities and ask for, for convergence. So anyway, the, the overall question is in what class of graphs does this process converge uh, and uh, quickly? Um, uh, and this takes us to the next question about random graph models. We already saw that GNP is great and, and, and you know, it helps us set up these things. But indeed, as somebody mentioned, the connector on the brain graph does show no, no noticeable deviations. In particular, 
um, uh, there is reciprocity. So if there's an edge from I to J, it's uh, the, the probability of the reverse edge is about four times higher than what you'd expect in a random graph. And similarly, the probability of triangles and other small motifs, small subgraphs is, is, is significantly higher. Um, you know, what deviations would actually be helpful for these computations? And even more basic, how do we even model them? I mean, GNP was great, but how do, you, how do I generate a graph with these, with these variations? Just to emphasize, this is a very influential paper by Song et al, uh, which uh, they call it non-random, but by that they mean deviations from random. And in particular, the probabilities of uh, a third edge existing if, if, if A, B and AC exists, probably BC existing is, is much higher than, than, than random. And the same, same is true for other, other motifs in these vector graphs. So uh, uh, yes, I'm just pointing out that these, these probabilities are much higher. So they seem to strengthen the convergence results for our projection convergence, for example. I, you know, uh, if you have reciprocity, then there's higher density. If there's triangle completion, that helps with things like association because, because of the birthday paradox, the probability that your neighbors are connected is higher and therefore you, you, get, you get association. Um, it, however, to prove this formally is, 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 is wide open uh, to show that assembly operations actually become more robust with, with these or other departures from GNP. And to go on this line a little bit further, you know, um, you, you know, a popular model for, for various uh, good reasons is the stochastic block model. So generalization of GNP, where instead of having just one P everywhere, you might have different probabilities for different blocks. And, uh, and uh, let's say there's a degree of D for each, for each vertex or bounded by D. Now this, this model cannot uh, efficiently capture uh, having a large number of short cycles. So for example, triangles simply because the number of uh, K cycles will be bounded by the trace of a realization of, 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 of a sample from this such a matrix to the power of K, which is in turn bounded by the rank times D to the K, the degree to the K. And, uh, and so therefore, in order to get a number of cycles that's actually growing with the number of vertices, you'd require the rank of the stochastic block model to be linear in the number of vertices, which makes it sort of pointless. You're kind of writing down the whole graph. Um, there's a related result. Uh, on the impossibility of low rank representations for triangle rich complex networks by Seshadri et al. just earlier this year. So just to focus on this one question, how do you generate triangle rich GNP? So you want the same P, but you want triangles to be much higher. And, in, in, and more generally, you know, if I want uh, uh, desired densities of given sets of graphs. In complete generality, this is a quite hard problem. It's been studied from the point of view of uh, graph regularity uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, uh, but we're, we're focusing on the generating models and one small answer is the following simple way to do it, which is that we basically create a random graph as a union of smaller, more dense graphs. So instead of creating one GNP, we pick a lot of uh, GSQs, uh, you know, pick a subset of S vertices, but put there a random graph with a slightly higher probability and take a union of a bunch of these. So you've got these communities that are overlapping uh, with higher density. That turns out will give you more number of triangles while matching the density. And actually you can get any clustering coefficient, which is the probability that your neighbors are connected if, uh, you know, that, that a pair of your neighbors are connected and degree distribution that's realizable, can be realizable in this model. Now, of course, it's a stretch from saying that some process like this happens in the, in the brain or any other natural setting, but nevertheless, it's a simple model and suggests that there's more and other interesting ones uh, for this. Okay, so that, that's about random graph departures. This could be very fruitful for studying such graphs. Another fascinating question here is about sparsification. We've touched on this a uh, few times and truly. Uh, the maximum of synapses is, is, is close to birth and most synapses are pruned early uh, around age two and onwards they're pruned uh, early. And let's say for a second that pruning is also Hebbian, meaning that if, 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 if it turns out that uh, I and J are rarely uh, 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 firing in close proximity, then the edge weight goes down and at some point it's deleted. So here's a question. Suppose I start with GNP. What's a Hebbian process that results in higher triangle density or some other motive densities? You know, this sort of process study was very useful uh, when we were uh, looking at um, uh, things like the rich get richer, you know, the, 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 uh, the model where uh, you know, you, you, an, an incoming vertex chooses its neighbors according to their current degrees. Uh, this, this incremental model gives us a very nice results explaining uh, things like power law distributions. Here we're asking, 
you know, what's a Hebbian or, or, or such, uh, another such local process that could give you higher triangle density, for example, just as a concrete question. Uh, is there one? And more generally, you know, triangle density is one particular uh, measure. Um, what's, a, what's a way to sparsify directed graphs? You know, sparsifying undirected graphs has turned out to be immensely fruitful. It's led to fast algorithms for many things, including uh, uh, linear systems, at least Laplacian linear systems. Um, and here we're asking, you know, what's a, what, what could you do for directed graphs? Maybe you don't want to preserve cuts, maybe it's something else, maybe the spectrum, maybe some neural function, like the con convergence of an assembly. So, so this, this is a maybe less well-defined, but equally fascinating and quite likely productive area uh, direction to, to pursue. Uh, um, here's a question about this process again, one more question. So what we're doing here is KCAP, right? Which is, uh, uh, think of it as, as a neural network. We get input from the previous layer and we're saying the top K neurons that fire, the top K units that fire, that, that are the ones that fire. Among all the ones that are receiving input, take the ones that receive the maximum input, the top K, those are the ones that fire. Uh, if you had a, a usual gate, there would be a threshold and everything higher than a certain threshold would fire. That would be the, 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 the deep learning way of doing it. So is KCAP more robust? Is there some advantage to KCAP as opposed to just using individual thresholds? So basically now we're saying, imagine that in any hidden layer, the K uh, neurons with the highest input will fire, not the ones that happen to exceed their threshold. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, so every layer, there will be K firing. Uh, uh, you know, whereas you know, with, with, with the normal operation, it could be that some layers, almost nothing is firing uh, or, or, or too many are firing. And uh, the answer is empirically yes. In this paper by Zhao, Zhang, and Zheng, uh, they showed that uh, empirically that uh, indeed uh, uh, using this method uh, handles this, 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 this vanishing gradient problem, but also is more robust to, to, to perturbations. Uh, proving that would be great. But here is a, is a, is a more co concrete question. Can we show that random projection and cap converges to say stable assemblies, even when the K-CAP op operation is noisy? In a, we assume the pure K-CAP operation, right? Where the top K, but let's assume, ah, it's not exactly the top K, it's uh, one minus epsilon of the top K plus epsilon of other things. So there's noise at every uh, epoch of the, op of, of the entire process. Do we still get a more or less stable assembly? So, so the, the, there are two parts to it. First, is it more robust? And second, is the process itself robust to noise? And, and both seem to be interesting. So finally, we get to the, to the, to the question of learning, which is perhaps the, 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 the most uh, um, motivating one here. Um, you know, we know that learning, a lot of convincing learning happens with gradient descent. Does it happen in the brain? This is still a topic of debate. There's not much evidence. Synaptic plasticity, though, it's clear that it is one, is it a primary mechanism for the brain? Is it effective? You know, is it effective to, to learn higher level concepts? Um, and then maybe even more optimistically, could it be that synaptic plasticity has an advantage over gradient descent? As, you know, why is the brain doing it instead of gradient descent? Why didn't it evolve to do gradient descent? So let's go back to, 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 to assemblies. You know, in particular, could the brain learn through assemblies? This question came up in, in in a different form in the previous talk. So this is a crucial problem for us to think of this. And then the best formulation of the problem itself is unclear. Or how should we set up the problem of what is the task to be solved to, to call it learning? Um, there's initial progress with Boolean function learning. I'll mention that. There's also progress through uh, a use, thinking of the brain as a recurrent neural net. Um, and then and I'll mention that as well. So first think, think of it as supervised assemblies. This is work uh, by uh, Rangamani and Gandhi at MIT where they said, you know, we're creating these assemblies, but let's also have assemblies for labels, sort of at a higher level, we'll have assemblies for labels. So let's say it's a Boolean function. So there's an assembly for zero and assembly for one. And when you present an example, you know it's correct label, let's say zero, the incorrect label area is inhibited. So all the connections there, they don't change because the, the area for one doesn't fire at all. The area for zero is set to on. And so all those connections will, will have Hebbian plasticity, just Hebbian plasticity. And what they show is that just with this, uh, uh, you know, it effectively, uh, uh, in their experiments, effectively learns and and or, and then they try to use this framework to also do, um, you know, uh, one of the first benchmarks, NEST classification. So 
at least at a rudimentary level, plasticity can be an effective supervised learning device for, for this Boolean classification where you present the, the label. How about unsupervised? Now, this, this, this maybe is in a sense more natural to the brain. You know, we, we know that the assembly projection already preserves overlap, but you could ask the following question. Suppose your stimuli are naturally coming from different clusters, you know, different subsets, like different uh, you know, groups of smells or, 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 or images or whatever. Uh, and let's say we model them as we usually do by distributions. There's a distribution one for one class of, of stimuli, distribution two for a second class of stimuli. And now all of these are presented to, to, to an area and uh, you're creating assemblies. What would be nice is if there was one assembly for distribution one and one assembly for distribution two, which had relatively small overlap. You know, can this, can this, can this actually happen? So here's, here's an experiment that, uh, that uh, first year student uh, Max uh, Bagia just did. Um, you take uh, two different such sparse Bernoulli distributions, they're in 100 dimensions. And then you do a sparse random projection to a thousand neurons. So you're just expanding out these the sensory level, cap of 100. So now uh, we, we have the usual process, random projection and cap with Hebbian plasticity, several rounds of this. So that if you had normally presented just one input, it would go to an assembly. But here's what happens. In this picture, every row is an example. This is at the end of round one, the, the lighter colored, the yellow ones are actually the firing neurons. Every column is a neuron, there are a thousand neurons. And then you can see that as you go along, it stabilizes and by the end, more or less exactly the same set of hundred neurons are firing. For class two also has hundred neurons, but it's a different hundred neurons. Now, let me tell you how the presentation was done. You present five examples from class one, five examples of class two in alternate. So you do get a little help. You get several examples from the same class. So that's how you, know, you see several images of the same type, several images of a different type, several same for type one, type two. And that seems to be enough to create two assemblies that are very different from each other. In fact, if you look at the firing probability over all the examples, they, 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 they look like this. This is sorted according to the, to the first class and they're almost disjoint and, and, and almost uh, uh, uniformly high. Um, yeah, so even though the original stimuli had large overlap even between classes, uh, and, and not so large overlap within classes, it, it, it kind of diverges to, to make it uh, almost one and zero. And then if you do this with four different classes, it still does something very similar with, uh, with, with a little overlap between classes. So a research question, can we prove this? And then maybe, maybe to, to bring it back to uh, uh, more familiar theories, can we get this to, let's say, happen with the data that comes from half spaces? So, you know, everything that's on one side of the half space is cluster one, everything on the other side of the half space is cluster two, Will we be able to create uh, two assemblies, one for each, and thereby do uh, you know, unsupervised learning of, uh, of, 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 of this, this type of clustered data? Okay, so uh, 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 a last question about learning um, is, uh, are plasticity rules provably effective to learn, right? So we're, we're showing experiments and asking concrete questions about, you know, can we learn these models, but okay. So what do I mean by plasticity rule? So far we've seen the Hebbian rule which has, has, has been the basis for everything so far. But it could be more general. And in fact, neuroscientists have observed and are observing very, very interesting uh, plasticity rules. Uh, one in particular that, 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 that uh, Chris has uh, um, pointed us to is um, where the, the, the increase in an edge ij depends not just on the firing activity at i and j, but also at the firing activity of all inputs to, to j. To look at j, it, of course, is receiving inputs from all of its uh, uh, presynaptic uh, neurons. And uh, the, the weight of an, the change of an edge could depend on all of those in, particular, in principle. But maybe something more general. You know, why does it have to be uh, just uh, ij and this fixed rule, which seems nice, could be something more general. So, so, so that's this whole landscape of what is a plasticity rule. Now, recurrent neural nets are particularly well suited for this. Uh, you see, because uh, at each neuron, you're recording not just what happened in this instant, but you could see the sequence of activations, right? So what is the sequence of activations? I fired in round one, didn't fire in round two, fired in round three, and so on. And based on the sequence, you could decide what to do. Sequence at I and sequence at J, you could decide what to do on the edge IJ. So you get this family of plasticity rules. And, but, but then what is a good plasticity rule? How do I choose one? Well, for this, we can optimize. And we could use uh, gradient descent, uh, for example, to find a good plasticity rule. You know, this is in the framework of a, of a lot of work in learning uh, and especially uh, deep learning where they, we talk about learning to learn. You know, what's a good gradient descent rule, you know, in terms of all the parameters you could set. Uh, but here we're asking specifically about plasticity rules. 
And, and so uh, we did some experiments and did some very nice rules emerge and rules that generalize from one data set to another. Um, I just want to point out one thing since, since this is a, a group of friendly theoreticians that two very successful uh, rules, provably successful rules, the perceptron rule and the perceptron and multiplicative weight algorithms are both uh, plasticity rules, just uh, two by two plasticity rules where you only apply it to the output layer. You know, just think looking at the output layer, you can view them as plasticity rules. And it turns out that optimizing just the output layer rule is in fact a convex problem, at least for the very commonly used cross entropy loss. Also, if you, if you optimize it, then you will converge to a particular sign pattern for the plasticity rule. So this means that you know if the neuron is on and the output is, uh, is, is, is also on, then you should increase. If the neuron is on and the output is off, you should decrease. And that's what the sign pattern means. And it turns out that anything with this sign pattern inherits the guarantees that we are, the familiar guarantees for the perceptron algorithm, uh, where the perceptron is just minus one, 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 minus one. Okay. So, so there is something to be said, but it's for the output rule. So again, sort of a familiar situation in some sense, but, but taken to a different context. So the question, uh, an outstanding question here is, can we say anything about the graph, the, 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 the recurrent neural network plasticity rule? Empirically, we find that the, using a, a plasticity rule for the graph in addition to the output layer gives us consistently a few percent uh, improvement in the accuracy of predictions and generalization. But how do we prove anything about it? It's no longer a convex problem. So, so we can't fall back on familiar tools, uh, but, but, but maybe there's still some hope. Uh, finally, you know, uh, uh, another amazing aspect of the brain is how robust is it? it is. You know, babies all around the world learn to speak language correctly and, and walk correctly and, and, uh, or without falling and so on. Seems to learn concepts from very few examples. That's one difference from the brain and BERT. And it denoises a variety of data, right? All kinds of data and we know what to pick up on. Deep learning, as you know, for all its successes, is still famously brittle to adversarial examples. So, is there, is there something we learned here? How do we get get to this? This is, of course, a huge topic in machine learning. Um, I just want to point you to one little experiment, which is let's compare a gradient descent based classifier to a plasticity rule based classifier. So, the weights were trained in one case with gradient descent, in another case with a plasticity rule. And as you see, if you then try to adversarially perturb them, it turns out that you have to perturb the, the plasticity rule based one much more for the plasticity rule based classifier before it starts calling it something that it's not, before it starts giving it an, a, a wrong label, even though the perturbation. In, fair, in fairness, the gradient descent before performs better. Right? Yes, the, the, the accuracy, the baseline accuracy of gradient descent is better, but, uh, but the robustness of the, of, the, of the plasticity rule is, 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 is better. So the plasticity rule is the one on the right. And uh, this is just another example. Of the, of the same thing on two familiar data sets. So is training with plasticity rules provably more robust to adversarial examples? That's sort of another concrete question. And that is in fact, our last uh, slide. So I haven't been keeping track of the questions on chat, but- I, I have been, and, and, and I believe I've been answering a, a few. Okay, but uh, yes, uh, we, we, we would love to hear more questions if any, on any, of the, any, any part of the tutorial. So if anybody has a question, we'll be delighted to, to, to entertain you to hear, to listen. Uh, we have three official minutes, but we are not going anywhere. So uh, Maybe I'm curious, uh, who are the students uh, doing this uh, research of let's say learning with assemblies? Maybe I would like to talk to them. Oh, sure. Uh, um, uh, um, um, maybe easiest if I add them on a slide, but uh, 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 one of them is, uh, is uh, uh, um, Rarish Christian, who's now a PhD student at MIT. Uh, he did it as part of his undergraduate thesis. Uh, then Chris has already mentioned uh, Dan Mitropolsky, who's on our paper. Uh, he's a third year uh, PhD student at Columbia, works on language and other things. Um, here at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, there are two first year students uh, who, who are one working on this robustness aspect, uh, uh, Max Debagia, and then I mentioned Mirabel Reed, who's working on the convergence in geometric random graphs. Uh, and then I know that from Christos's class, there are several groups of students working on various things, including directed sparsification, 
and language orders, verb, verb, verb and uh, subject, object order. Thanks. Um, can I ask something? Yes. Sure, you're uh, It's about your last point. So um, I guess gradient descent, uh, when you do deep learning, is just a method of adjusting the weights on the edges of the network. And I guess plasticity rules are a different way. So uh, do, do you have any idea why uh, there is a difference in, in robustness? Uh, I mean, what, what, what is qualitatively different in the output of these processes? Okay, so, so basically, what um, uh, so what is qualitative difference is the following that that gradient descent uh, tries to finely tune every weight of every edge in the network the plasticity rule tries to come up with a general rule whereby the weights are going to react to everything that happens, okay? Mm -hmm. So, in some sense, it's a much uh, less uh, uh, detailed, okay? So, you know, so it, 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 it finds the best possible, but generic, gener generalized rule that has to apply to every edge, okay? So, you know, and, and, and uh, so in some sense, it's, uh, it's very, you know, it's very disadvantaged in the competition, okay? And it turns mm -hmm. out that it excels, okay, it does reasonably well uh, in uh, accuracy, but it excels in two other directions, dimensions. One is the robustness that uh, Santos mentioned, so you know that, that, that uh, you have to work very hard to fool it after, mm -hmm. after, after it has classified something. And the other one is generalization that you can you can train it uh, on uh, on uh, on uh, images mm -hmm. and then uh, give it auditory signals so you know and it's it, and it's going to to do reasonably well yeah so 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 using the same rule on very different uh, very different networks or, uh -huh. or different dimension even still makes sense right because you're looking only locally um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, but, you know, Yuval, I, I, we don't know. I mean, uh, why is this more robust at the end of the day? Uh, you know, uh, one nice thing that go, is going back to the perceptron itself. So if you go back to the nice setting of linearly classifiable data, you know, mm -hmm. then as you mentioned, the perceptron algorithm is a plasticity rule. You can think of it as doing it on a plus, great. Now, normally, if you just run the perceptron algorithm, it might not give you a robust solution. What is a robust solution with half spaces? You want it to be far from the margin, right? You want to you want yeah. to classify with a large margin. But as Avram uh, pointed out to me recently, there's a you take a small modification of the perceptron algorithm and it'll make it robust, which is that basically you you keep training as long as there is some example that is close to the margin. Don't yeah. stop when every example is on the right side, and that's already enough. And if there is a margin to begin with, it will find it, and it will mm -hmm. give you that margin. And so it's it's robust naturally, you know. Yeah. Uh, now, whether this happens in the presence of errors and in the presence of a kernel, okay, these are all, mm -hmm. yeah. and whether the right notion of robustness is, is margin or, or something more effective for this complicated data set. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So Thomas is asking whether the assembly calculus uh, reflects uh, the, the brain's true robustness. Okay, so you know, so that's that's the idea. That's why we are, do, we are doing these experiments. Okay, so you know, the, uh, I mean, you know, here is a general picture. Sort of, you know, uh, the, the general picture is the following: that uh, 60 years ago, some computer scientists read. Uh, a neuroscience book, which back then was 30 pages uh, uh, 
Okay, so you know we knew nothing about the brain, and said, okay, I can write a program that uh, that acts like the neuron. Okay, so you know, and this after 50 years became uh, an incredible champion, right? I mean, you know, because because you know, and 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 can and can can learn uh, uh, everything. Okay, you know, so that you know, it's it's uh, you know that that's uh, um, now the question is. Uh, but then, of course, these devices, the artificial neural networks that we see today, they, you know, their, their creators uh, are the first to admit they are not uh, neurorealistic. Okay, so you know there is a huge uh, intellectual enterprise, sort of you know very clever work done in trying to reconcile the two, the brain, the brain, and and, and gradient descent, and sort of you know it's it's uh, you know the, 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 there is beautiful work there. But the truth is that uh, artificial neural networks are not brain-like, okay? But of course, artificial neural networks are done for something. They're not, they don't need to be brain-like, okay? And so it's not, it's not a fair uh, criticism. Of course it's not. Unless you believe that the non-brain-likeness them, of them uh, is at the root of their weaknesses, okay? And what are their weaknesses? There are three. There is brittleness to, uh, to you know, non-robustness to, uh, to adversarial attacks. Okay. There is lack of generalization. So you know what you train for uh, for for uh, ImageNet uh, only works on ImageNet. Okay. So you know, and and uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the, 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 there is uh, there is uh, the third one. Um, uh, Sorry, uh, need for supervision. Yeah. Okay, so you know we are not going to tell you. You know you have to walk. So so learn uh, take this data in. Okay, so you know we we choose our data. We cho our brain chooses its own data. Okay, so you know and and, and so so these three things. Uh, uh, m it could be that uh, that these uh, these uh, three weaknesses, so to speak, of of, a, of artificial neural nets have their roots in the unbrain unbrain likeness of the ANNs, okay? And it could be that going back and incorporating some uh, brain-like features, like plasticity coefficients, or you know, is, is, is our current, the current thing we're trying to, 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 to work on. Uh, it could be that, that, uh, that it uh, uh, corrects some of these. Um, it sounds like uh, we should wrap this up now uh, because of uh, the, the the next tutorial uh, being held up is, 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 is what I'm understanding from the chat. I, I moved that by half an hour, so, so oh, you okay. have to be third time. Yeah. Oh, there's a, another question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm writing. Good point, Thomas. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so yes. That's that's uh, 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 yes. That that's a very good point. That uh, uh, synaptic plasticity was uh, was of course uh, suspected, but was measured uh, in the 70s, right after right after uh, right after the. Uh, 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 the inspiration of neural nets uh, was uh, was uh, obtained. So um, uh, yes, I mean, plasticity is a very is a very fundamental uh, aspect of the way brains work, and uh, is at the root of a lot of the versatility that brains have. Okay, you know, so um, because I mean, in plasticity, I also pruning and and, and sparsification, so you know, is, is in some sense part of plasticity. Okay, so that's, uh, this is the, okay, all right. So, uh, 
Santos is running, is running. Uh... Project, just project. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit uh, primitive, the, 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 but you can see that uh, the red ones are the currently firing. And then the edges that are that have high 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 synaptic weight are ones being shown. Uh, is this? Uh... Try it again. Okay, good. Yeah. So and the the smaller box is things that were ever activated, and then. So at the end of 10 rounds, these neurons in this little box were touched at some point. And then these are the ones that are kind of connected with, with the higher weight edges. Uh, the two examples here, but basically, you know, the, the setup has uh, logic and loops, so you can uh, do whatever you want in this uh, environment here to, to, uh, to, this for example, does association, creates two, two uh, two assemblies and then projects them to a third area uh, together to make to see what happens but yeah <laughs> i don't want to pick up now. so there is there is there is a simple thing to play with there yeah Uh, uh, yes, the answer to, to, to Thomas's question is yes, and we'll, uh, there is already a GitHub uh, repo that uh, Dan Mitropolis' code sits on with the, with the implementation that, that, that accompanies our uh, paper on assemblies. Uh, but this, uh, this, this uh, simulation is, is new. It was done by uh, Seong Jae Jung, an undergrad here, uh, and we, we haven't yet posted that because as you can see, there's still some 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 cleanup to do. So, but, uh, the PNAS paper has a pointer to the to to Dan uh, Dan Mitropolsky simulator. And this is the this is using the same code just uh, ported to the to the web. Yeah. Great. If. Uh... It was great to have you uh, and uh, write to us uh, if questions come later. So, you know, we, are, we will be delighted to, uh, to chat with you. Uh, and thanks for listening and uh, enjoy the conference.